Thank you for downloading this Real Agriculture podcast. Excite your crops with inputs from Excite Bio. Access nitrogen and phosphorus with Excite Bio's lineup of inoculants and ag biologicals. Since 2010, they've been helping farmers harness the power of the soil. Learn more at excitebio.ca. That's X I T E B I O.ca. The Agronomist is brought to you by The Sharp Edge, Profitable Practices, and The Soybean School. The Soybean School on Real Agriculture is an agronomy and issues video series that allows soybean growers to learn on their own time at their own pace. The Soybean School is made possible by support from Syngenta Canada, Pride Seeds, and BASF. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and uh, I am very much looking forward to today's conversation. I've got two rock stars on. But of course, before we head to that, uh, a a few housekeeping items. Of course, hello to everyone joining us live uh, and in the chat. Hello to Kevin, who it's eight degrees. Goodness, I wish. But it does feel like spring is coming early. I got to tell you, we'll see where that ends up. Uh, For all of you who collect those CEU credits, head on over to realagricultura.com slash agronomist uh, as of tomorrow. Uh, Let us know you took in the program and we'll get you hooked up with those CEU credits. And of course, hello to Wild TV and to RFD TV Canada. Um, All right, tonight's topic It's a big one. It's one I've had on the radar for a while, and I'm really excited to have this conversation. We are going to talk about the power of rotation and try and understand why having a diverse crop rotation has so many benefits um, and what those benefits are. So let's bring in our guests without further ado. I've got with me Dr. Dave Hooker with the University of Guelph Richdown and Dr. Bobby Helgeson with the University of Saskatchewan. Welcome here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I'm so excited. Um, okay, so rotation is is uh, one of my favorite topics, and this is why I'm so excited. And that's even without talking about putting forages in, in rotation. So let's not even get ahead of ourselves. We're just talking about grain crops here. So uh, still very, very exciting. Okay, so before we dig right into it, though, let's get to know our guests. Uh, uh, Dr. Dave, what keeps you busy week by week over there? Well, that is quite a loaded question there. Um, I am just... Uh, crazy busy getting ready for um, this upcoming research year, of course, out in the field. But um, teaching is kind of my main focus this time of year. And um, and today I had uh, my students, I put them through three, just about three hours of straight teaching the same students for three hours. And I was, I was getting tired of hearing myself. I can't <laughs> imagine being in the seats for three hours. And, and enduring what, what they endured today. So I yeah, got to get, give credit to them for sure. And yeah. nobody passed out or anything like that. So that's good. Mm, that you know <laughs> of. They might have ways to uh, to cover it up. All right. And uh, Bobby, of course, joining us from the Un- University of Saskatchewan. Uh, what are you working on these days? Um, yeah, so I'm having a special year on sabbatical this year. So normally I would be much like Dave, heavy into teaching. Uh, this is the term where I teach soil microbiology to undergraduate third years, as well as to graduate students, and then another lab class for grad students. But this year, um, it's really an opportunity to focus more deeply on my research program. So yeah, we're, we've got a bunch of stuff growing in the greenhouse right now and looking forward to an exciting field year as well. Okay. Yes. So an early spring would be a good thing. Um, we're not going to do the whole Groundhog Day and say if we have six, more, of course we have six more weeks, but will they be six more weeks and then six more is really the question uh, out West. Uh, but I, right now, yeah. it feels it feels like it's going to be an early spring here in Ontario, at least. So uh, fingers crossed. Uh, all right. So we're talking rotation. And if, uh, for those of you following along, if you haven't figured out, um, Yes, we're going to talk a lot about what happens below ground, uh, not just what we see and what we measure above ground. Because, of course, uh, we're trying to figure out why the heck rotation has the power that it does. So perhaps we'll start uh, there, Dr. Dave, on, on sort of that concept overall. Generally speaking, what kind of benefits do we add up when we diversify a crop rotation? Well, crop rotation in itself, it is um, it is quite the tool 
that has been used essentially for centuries. You know, farmers have reaped the benefits of crop rotation for centuries. And so just for example, um, before nitrogen fertilizer came into the picture, um, farmers planted um, maybe a, a forage, a legume, and to generate, to produce their own nitrogen, and then follow that with a corn crop. And so that's a, a good crop rotation. It had a very functional use and purpose for that particular crop rotation. And I think when we look at, when we're investigating crop, investigating crop rotations, what we need to do is look at the functional aspects of crop rotations and figure out you know, why some crops have a benefit in some rotations more than others. And then as soon as we can understand that, then we can um, figure out exactly how to manage those rotations. So Bobby, I mean, your work is is looking at the soil aspect and so many aspects of this when we look at sort of overall and we are going to look at some specifics as well but overall what are some of the key differences that you see in the soil profile in the micro profile when you've got a diverse rotation versus a more simplistic or or you know corn on corn or corn or weed on weed on wheat yeah so i think when we think microbiology and crop rotation we're often the first default position to take is disease management or pest management. And so having a, the same host crop year after year after year opens the door of opportunity for pathogens to really pit in um, in a cropping system. So that's certainly a risk um, with non-diversified rotations. The slant that we've been taking more so in my research program is to try to, try to understand how um, different crop species form the basis for a different below ground diet, if you will, and how that affects nutrient cycling. So sort of this idea that much like us as humans, we thrive on a diverse and well-balanced diet, the soil microbiome does as well. And so if we're feeding it the same type of crop um, residue and live, live root carbon and nutrient cycling processes over and over and over again, we may well get imbalances that develop below ground. So the soil biome, microbiome likes diversity is there such thing and i'm being so much cheeky here but is there such thing as like junk food for soil microbes like do we have good food bad food no gosh. or not you know i think that microbial populations are so diverse that no matter what you feed them somebody is able to sort of gobble it up but mm. the likelihood that you would sort of dig a tree and, and end up in that feeding that same population repeatedly is so greatly increased with non-diversified rotations. And what mm. we want is to feed the whole diverse microbiome population uh, community, really. And so that's best served by different kinds of, of crop residues and, and other um, nutrient resources that are part of a diversified crop rotation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh dave tell us about some of the rotation and we've actually got a video clip of some of the some of the trials that you've put on as well but what are some of the things you're measuring in you know the long-term rotation trials that you're working with what parameters are you looking at to try and measure some of these differences yeah um right before i get into that though i just have to say that i have so much respect for soil microbiologists i just think <laughs> It's just Same. such oh oh it is just such a fascinating area. And when we look at rotational responses, quite often, like in the past, like 10 or 20 years ago, um, you know, or even when I was a student, they say, well, this is a rotation effect. We don't quite understand, you know, why this happens. And we just call it a black box rotation effect. But the more we understand about, you know, what is actually causing some soil or crop responses. A lot of times it leads to, you know, how like the micro microbiology, like the community and just how diverse it is and different populations that are competing for another for, for, for one another and um, just the functional aspects to uh, the microbiome and how it interacts with plants, you know, for like disease susceptibility, mm -hmm. uh, it reduces plant stress, um, drought stress. All of those can be like mitigated somewhat by um, microbiology. And so it's just a, 
huge, fascinating uh, topic. And so I, I'm kind of, I'm not jealous of Bobby, but I can really a little bit. You know, yeah. what, what she, <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So I just yeah, had to say that. Yeah. So I feel, I feel much better now getting that off my chest. I just, okay. I just feel better now. Good job. <laughs> Okay, so if we can pick up, uh, pull up uh, producer Jay, if you could just uh, pull up slide number one, please. Yeah, this is uh, my crop rotation trial at, uh, at Ridgetown. And when I give tours through here, I always say that this is my favorite project just because it has, has had so many different um, interesting outputs uh, from this that growers can apply, can directly apply to their field. And this is just an overview, a drone shot of um, the trials. I think it was in, in this case, it was in mid-July or something like that, just a couple of weeks away from weed harvest. And anyway, you can see the patchwork of different treatments and, and different rotations. We have seven rotations. We have uh, two different tillage systems. I'm uh, just uh, trying to find my camera here. Okay, I found it. <laughs> two different go. rotations and uh, four different nitrogen treatments. And so we have quite okay. a few different combinations, 56 uh, treatment combinations there. And of course the yield is important one to measure. And we try to measure um, like protein and the quality of grain, but we also try to measure the soil um, responses as well over time. And I do that mainly in collaboration with my colleagues who are more soil focused, like uh, like Dr. Laura Veneard and, and her team. Mm -hmm. And so we really, uh, look at these trials, Laura and I, as a, as a team, I kind of focus on the crop. She focuses a lot on the soil and the soil health. And she's looking at, you know, key measurements, soil measurements, like organic matter, um, organic carbon, uh, total nitrogen, um, and all of those by depth. And uh, we look at soil structure, aggregate stability, those kinds of soil, different measurements. And I also so collaborate with... Um, with some uh, colleagues on the main campus as well at Carrie Dunfield, which is also a, a yes. soil microbiologist, and she's doing uh, experiments in this in this trial as well. She has been on this show. Um, mm -hmm. I always love it when they've already been on here. Uh, let's leave this up for a moment, and we'll we've got a few more. But um, so so measuring things like yield, of course, protein quality, some of those aspects, um, and some soil characteristics as well. Now, Bobby, you, of course, in things that you measure look a lot different uh, for a lot of your trials, you're looking at different components and different, the the actual players in the soil. Um, and so one of the things, what would be uh, when you're looking at changes in, in soil based on rotation, what are the some of the things that you're following? Are you looking at bacteria, fungi, uh, like, what what would that list look like to you? Yeah, so we mostly look at bacteria and fungi in my program. We use a number of different tools to do that. So some of them are by using their DNA. Some of them are using different um, components of their cells. But we always try to do that extra step of pairing it with their function. So rather than just saying who's there and trying to infer what that means about you know, impacts of crop rotation, for example, or fertilizer management. We also try to measure things like enzyme activity that tell us about nutrient turnover or um, actual nutrient pools available and total nutrients. And so we then try to relate, okay, treatment A and treatment B have different memberships of these populations. And does that correlate to not only what we see with respect to yield, but also, for example, nitrogen cycling processes or carbon storage, for example? See, so this is why Dave gets a little jealous is because you get to provide the answers as to the why for the stuff that he measures. See how we're, we're just connecting dots here, people. Um, okay, we're going to come back to that discussion of, of sort of the population and their functions, uh, Bobby, because I think that's a really key one. And there's there's a few slides. I love that I asked you both to send me a couple slides for tonight and somehow you sent ones that um just fit together perfectly and yet you didn't you didn't discuss it first so you really understood the assignment um i really mm -hmm. i really appreciate that okay so um let's we've got a couple minutes here one of the things um i want to touch on dave as we go into some of your slides i think it's it's probably i know you're probably going to want to do them in order but i'm going to throw a wrench in the system and go to producer jay if you could go to slide three um 
so this is, and we've got a few of these and we can go over a couple of them. Um, but this, this I thought as a, as a starting point sort of outlines, as you said, you've got so rotation differences, tillage differences and nitrogen differences. And we'll certainly talk about some of those. Um, but these are the things that, that you, you're measuring. Walk us through what this looks like and some of these uh, findings that you've got. Yeah, so the, um, this is a graph that I just show um, a lot just because it resonates so well with producers. It's something that they can measure, of course. It's something that we can measure quite readily. And it's because of some of the long-term effects, of course, that we're, we have been seeing in our crop rotation trials. These long-term trials, they are just incredibly valuable because they can answer the long-term questions. And sometimes, you know, a system, a system does need a period of time between 10 and 15 or sometimes 20 years to equilibrate once it's changed. Like for example, if a tillage system changes and so it takes time, you know, for that system to equilibrate. And what we've seen in these trials is we've seen that rotations with wheat in them increases both corn and soybean yields. So these are corn yields and okay. CC stands for continuous corn. And in a plow system, um, ov averaged over the past um, uh, like 13 years in this data set, um, our average corn yield in continuous corn, 173 bushel per acre, corn soybean rotation, 165, which is similar to the continuous corn. But when we add wheat into the rotation, you can increase our corn yields, and in this case, 17 bushel per acre higher than in a corn soybean rotation. And we can say the same thing, maybe not quite as much in the no-till system or in the reduced till system, but we have a positive effect by including wheat in the system. And by including wheat in the system, like sure, enterprise analysis is important, but wheat should be given the credit for higher corn and soybean yields. And I have soybean yield graphs too, and that is slide number four, if you wanted to go yeah. with that. Hang on, just before we go there, hang yeah, on, Jay, sure, just stick, sure. stick with this for just a moment because, um, and, and yes, we have these for sort of the main crops so we can go through all of them. But one of the things here, and I, I don't, I haven't seen Wheat Pete on the chat yet, but I'm sure he will uh, thank you profusely for saying that we should get the credit <laughs> for this. Uh, but it's definitely, so we talk about this out West as well, that, you know, does canola get all the, canola is canola the money maker um so mm. but d it makes more in a diverse rotation so there you go now um bobby and this is somewhat you know obviously i'm not asking this from you know to be a perfect answer but when you look at the results of the no-till so we've got similar results for uh, adding soy and then and for wheat but in a no-till system the continuous corn really has a much lower yield from a microbiology perspective what are some of the things that would contribute to a yield difference like that in a no-till system, maybe more so than in a tillage system? Yeah, so I think anytime that we cause physical disturbance, we increase the amount of contact between crop residues and the soil. And the soil, of course, of course, is home to all of those decomposer microorganisms. And so when we reduce tillage, one of the reasons we get carbon accumulations is because we slow down that decomposition process. Um, the other thing that happens in no-till systems is that you can get stratification of nutrients. So in a huge biomass crop like corn, <laughs> um, you can begin to get some imbalances of decomposition just because of, um, well, I shouldn't say, I wouldn't say, I should take that back. I don't want to say no-till causes imbalances, but tillage causes redistribution. <laughs> and so that could be part of the, the difference there. I mean, we very strongly in the West often find that we see really positive effects of no-till. So there I am sort of panicking, panic mode when I say no-till might be causing an imbalance. Uh, but with that big, you know, all of that leftover corn stove or leaving it at the surface, it does slow down decomposition. And um, I would suspect um change microbial population dynamics in the in the top yeah. 30 centimeters for example so through throughout the rooting zone really mm -hmm. yes and this is of course this is an ontario example it is with continuous corn um and for western canada where moisture is far more limiting there are plenty of really great advantages for no tillage that 
potentially um, we would have different graphs, certainly, but same principles apply, right? It's still about um, actual access to that residue to actually break it down um, and that stratification that can sometimes occur. Um, and so I'm going to put this in. So we've got some great questions coming in. Uh, so uh, we've got Laurent Van Arkel showing up. Uh, how many years into the trial did the no-till plots take to adjust? Great question doc for Dr. Dave. Uh, when you talked about the, the trial, sort of why over time is so important, um, how long did it sort of take mm -hmm. to adjust? Well, I, you know, I think that's a great question. It gets asked a lot, you know, how long does a system take to adjust and then if it is system adjusts, for instance, if the no-till system, you know, adjusts, can it then mitigate any yield difference, you know, usually between a, like a plowed system and a no-till system? So maybe those yields would come back, you know, so they okay. would yield um, the same. So that's a very common question. And interesting enough, um, these trials and also at the Alora Research Station, there's a trial, a very similar trial. It's a sister project. And, and it's, it's just interesting that the no-till yields at Ridgetown, um, ever since I took this trial over, uh, strat this project over about 13 years ago, the no-till yields were very, they were just not different compared to the plowed system. And the, the data are right here. Like, as you can see in the corn soybean wheat rotation, 186 versus 182 in the plowed and very similar. But at a lower research station, there is a reduced yield, a lower yield in the no-till. And that has been in place at, that uh, those trials have been in place since 1982 at Alora, And no-till has never caught up to the plowed system um, at Alora, So they're always less. Mm -hmm. So I think that, and I talked to the students about this today because we were talking about tillage and crop rotation today in class. So this is very, like, um, very, I guess, um, current. Deja vu? This, um, Sorry. This talk, yes, almost deja <laughs> yeah, vu. A little bit. I'm thinking about, yeah, almost. I'm thinking about that three-hour class. I'm going, ah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so yeah. anyway, um, so I just lost my train of thought. Sorry. Oh. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah the, the no-till system at Alora has never caught, got caught up, caught, caught up in terms of the yields equaling each other at Alora and some other long-term other long-term projects the same thing has happened but some growers have noticed you know yields approaching are very similar to one another um, after a number of years of no tillage but just we have not experienced that in our data but we we think that it is because we are learning to manage that system it's not let, like the system is catching up or is changing that much but we are learning you know to manage a crop differently in a different system and it really i think that deserves a lot more attention than the actual mm -hmm. system itself changing even though that we can see you know we can measure some of those system changes mm -hmm. and we've got a, a slide we're going to talk about later about in in tough years how some of these plots uh perform because that's also one of it now mm -hmm. jim did ask in looking at this slide and there's a few others we'll go to in a minute uh using the 120 or 160 pounds of fertilizer of nitrogen per acre was nitrogen your limiting nutrient and made worse on the high carbon and nitrogen ratio of corn residue so a question there of um, now this is this is research, right? You fix certain variables so that you can compare the outcome of them. Um, but do you think that that high carbon and nitrogen ratio is is a factor there in applying those rates? Um, yes, um, I, I don't publish these results very often or just say them, um, but but we have a nitrogen rate in our continuous corn trial that is um, very high, and okay. in that treatment we can have the same yield in continuous corn with very high rates of nitrogen as in our corn soybean wheat rotation. So um, that, but that system, of course, our yields are higher, but we're using a lot of fertilizer nitrogen where that's very expensive, but the corn seems to be using that extra nitrogen, but economically it's just not favorable to use so much nitrogen for the same yield. It's just interesting because when we have wheat in the rotation, our nitrogen use efficiency increases with wheat 
in the system. Mm. And we think it's because of the nitrogen that's stored in the uh, soil organic matter. Uh, that's it's, There's a lot more nitrogen that's mineralizing from soil organic matter. And that's given credit, you know, should be given credit to the wheat enterprise in the system. Mm -hmm. Or really to the microbes during the work, which is exactly what we're going to talk about in, in just exactly. one moment. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Producer Jay, if you would, we're going to uh, send a shout out to our second shout out of the night to our show sponsors. And then we'll uh, get back into this and talk about those, those buddies underground in just a moment. Thanks for watching The Agronomist. Our show sponsors are The Soybean School, The Sharp Edge, and Profitable Practices. Profitable Practices on Real Agriculture is a video series featuring Canadian producers who are adopting farm practices to have a positive impact on profit, people, and the planet. Made possible by Farm Credit Canada and RBC Royal Bank. Check out all the videos at realagriculture.com slash profitable dash practices. Shout out to my sheep making a little uh, cameo there. Anyway, uh, okay, so this is uh, this is where I want to bring in sort of exactly that discussion, uh, Dr. David. Great question, Jim. On uh, you know, really, it's about nutrient cycling within the soil as well, and what is driving that or not. Um, and so, if we could, producer Jay, can you bring up uh, Bobby's number? I think it's slide three. The bacteria. And the the populations, yeah, here we go. Okay, so this is, of course, one of the questions that I, I know this is a bit busy, um, everyone following along, but Bobby, if you can walk us through, this sort of lays out some of the changing of the populations. And I'm really cu curious to know how this might play into some of the questions that, that we get about what actually drives change in rotation. So if you will. You bet. So with the caveat that I have to be able to talk about slide number two next, um, this absolutely. particular slide um, on the left hand side, we've got bacterial and fungal communities represented by different color dots. So um, on the right hand side, we have the same thing. But on the left, we've been, we're looking at a wheat system, a long term wheat system at Swift Current. And so all of the red symbols are continuous wheat, whereas the blue and green are wheat in a four year rotation. So a wheat pea wheat canola rotation. Um, on the left-hand side, we're looking at a long-term corn trial from um, Southern Ontario, so it's uh, near Harrow. And same thing, the red and green is continuous corn in red or corn in rotation in green. And so what we're really looking for here is to see groupings by color. So let's start with the corn system on the right. We can see that the dots that are red seem to group together and the dots that are green group together. What that's really telling us is that bacterial communities and fungal communities in the continuous corn versus the corn in rotation are different. So red is like red, so the fungi are more similar to one another in the continuous corn, and green is like green, they're more similar to each other in the corn in rotation. In contrast, on the left-hand side, we don't really see that same grouping of red versus blue and green in the right. system. So take home message here is that we did see shifts in community structure, both bacteria and fungi in the corn system when we were comparing continuous versus corn in rotation, but less drastic differences in the wheat based system. And so these are both long term trials. The one at Swift Current is quite a lot longer. Um, the one in Ontario is 15 years and the one in Swift Current was nearly 30 when we took these measurements back in 2016. And what's now, really cool. Go yeah, ahead. Go yeah, ahead. I'll let you. Well, I was going to say these are bacteria and but did you distinguish you know friend versus foe or is this like total or what do these you know is there a type that's along with these yeah so each one of those particular symbols if you can wrap your brain around it represents a few thousand bacterial species and so this is some fancy multivariate statistics that actually yep. takes a whole bunch of data points thousands of them and models it into two-dimensional space so that our brains can yeah. sort of visualize what that community is looking Thank like. You. So it okay. is community leadership. It's based on their taxonomic identity as determined by DNA. Each one of those data points represents a community. So okay. data points that land together are similar communities and data points that are far apart from one another in those graphs are communities that are different from one another. Okay. Thank you. That makes sense to me. All right. 
the slide before, right, Bobby? Is what you wanted to yeah. want to know? Yeah. So okay. Let's do slide number well. two, actually. So we saw, again, I'll yes. just re remind you uh, from a minute ago that in the corn system, we did see pretty big shifts in um, bacterial and fungal communities in corn and rotation, but less so in the wheat system. Um, at the beginning of, of the podcast, I mentioned we also like to measure different nutrient pools and functional characteristics of the microbial community. And so those are represented in those um, box plots. We don't need to you know, squint too hard to figure out what that's all saying. I can summarize by saying sometimes we saw differences in individual microbial activities or nutrient pool sizes. But if we look again at those dot plots, what we can see is there's definitely a grouping of red versus everything else in both okay. systems. And so this is taking all of those functional attributes of the soil microbial community and analyzing them in the same kind of statistical model that we did for the microbial taxonomic identity and saying, what's the same and what's different? And so what this is really telling us is, yes, we saw some shifts in microbial community, but we really do see pretty substantial shifts in the overall soil functional characteristics in the diverse versus continuous serial rotations. And that's linked to the long-term um, activities of the microbial community, sort of a cumulative effect, if you will. So sometimes, and on this program, but, but you know, social media or discussions or, or those sorts of things, so there are times that people say, you know, tillage, uh, favors one type of soil um, organism uh, in tillage system versus non or, uh, you know, and, and that you want, I've heard it said, you know, oh, that's too much bacteria or that's too much, too many fungal pathogens or fungal, um, you know, populations or whatever. Does that really yeah. play out that one system favors the other or is it really more about the crops in rotation or do we even need to worry about about that? Like, is is a soil that that has a growth in bacterial, if they're good bacteria, isn't that okay? How do we make that judgment call? Yeah, so I think any time that you have a system that's tilting the scales in favor of either a functional group or a large population, you're probably going to develop an imbalance because our soils and their long-term sustainable function or long-term sustainable functioning is really based on a lot of give and take and populations that can shift and adapt. And we, we call it functional diversity, but what it means is that, you know, under dry can need this particular microbial population. And so um, that population comes in, it does its thing, but if conditions get very wet, suddenly it might not be useful at all. And what we need is functional diversity so that a different population can come in and perform that same function because the function is necessary. Let's call it nitrogen mineralization or nitrification, for example. We need those processes to be occurring in soil under all kinds of conditions. And so if we sort of build a system where it only works well under one set of conditions, we, we begin to have, we call it dysbiosis, but um, imbalances. That is a new word that I did not know that I am going to try and spell and look up later. Um, okay, so so fascinating though. So that, that really is about the, like our, our soil, microbes so what lives in our soil is going to change obviously based on conditions and one of those things is going to be what host crop is there year over year or the next year or whatever but also as you mentioned dry wet all those sorts of things which dr dave has a slide about which i i don't know that i want to jump all the way there dr dave but i i think we should because i think it fits into this Although I know there's lots of people that want to see the yield slides, and we will do that too. Um, but this this plays in really well. Um, producer Before Jay, we hop over, to... oh yeah, go Wendy, ahead. Can I just say? So you mentioned a minute ago that we have, you know, it's not a good thing to have the same host crop year over year after year after year. But I'm just also going to bring it back to that different that that idea of a different a diversity of diet as well, mm. right? So we know false crops have narrower carbon nitrogen ratios than cereal crops. And so thinking about um, the quality and the quantity of the food is just as important as that crop being a particular host crop. Mm -hmm. Dave, Dave has his hand up. Down in front, Dave, yes. what would you like to ask? I have, I have a question for Bobby. And I was just yeah. wondering, I was just wondering, when we talk about crop rotation diversity, is it the, really the diversity that we should be looking at? Or is it the specific crop that's changing the microbiology 
you know, that is producing a favorable crop response, let's say in the next crop into the future? Like what is, what's going on there? Yeah, I think all of the above, like it's why microbiology is so cool, but why it can be so overwhelming, right? Like I think yeah. um, we haven't talked about how important different plant functional traits can be in crop rotations yet, but big root systems, small root systems, shallow root systems, mycorrhizal plants, nitrogen fixing plants. We've touched on that a little, a little while ago. And so all of these things play together, right? It's not that microbes take plants and convert them into something good, bad, or otherwise. Um, and it's not that plants create good or bad or otherwise microbial communities. It's sort of this iterative trade-off through time that, that then we can balance, balance yeah. through our management adjustments, like you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Dave, are you alluding to that wheat is magical and therefore wheat needs to be in rotation? Or like Kevin has asked, would our winter wheat ryegrass cover crop planted behind silage corn in the fall and grown over winter provide similar results to wheat grown over summer? It's a good question. Does it have to be wheat in rotation or is it the fact that you've added a fall seeded cereal? Mm -hmm. So it's a very yeah. good question. So Dave, how would you answer a question like Kevin's? Have you, would you see similar results with a, with a cover crop added into that mix versus winter wheat that's taken off the screen? Yeah, it's a very good question. And sometimes we do have fairly short rotations. And um, we we know that, you know, if you have a lot of crops in rotation, uh, right crop species, we can have some positive benefits to those crops. The thing is about a cover crop, usually they only grow for a very short period of time. And so we can only get, you know, those benefits, they might accrue over a short period of time compared to a main crop where they may, like the main crop um, may last, you know, for like several months, like growing right. in the same field. And so those benefits would accrue over a longer period of time. And so to answer the question, I think a main crop, such as a small grain cereal crops, and we always talk about wheat, but the same holds true for, um, a lot of other small grain cereal crops like barley and oat as well, uh, spring wheat, winter wheat, they would all kind of fit into that category as um, very important for cropping, for crop rotations, especially corn and soybean yield responses. And I think it, a, a lot of that has to come with the microbial community that is changing mm -hmm. in addition to soil structure, aggregate stability, and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So, and, and Kevin adds, and I should, I should note, Kevin is in uh, the Fraser Valley in BC, um, so it never freezes there, according to me. Anyway, um, he said that they silage it in the spring and plant it back to corn. Um, so, I mean, yes, as far as a, a crop goes, he's keeping the ground covered. There's always something yeah. there about what the length of, really, it's the corn that's going to be growing the longest length of time through any of the growing season and the cover crop on the, on the shoulder from there. Um, yeah. if this does play into, and Bobby, I'll go to you on this. So Ahmed is asking about including flax or sunflower in a rotation that has soybeans, canola, corn, and wheat. So this is under Western Canadian. This is Manitoba is his question. Um, but so along those lines of, you know, is it a magical crop or is it rooting depth, rooting structure, all those benefits um, from so how does adding something like sunflower, let's say, into a rotation like that offer benefits? Right. So this is where I'll remind myself and, and everyone here that I'm not a field agronomist, but I can say that <laughs> flax and sunflower are both highly mycorrhizal crops. And so that can have positive impacts on the way that plants are mining phosphorus from the soil. And those positive impacts can then cascade into subsequent growing seasons. I can't honestly speak to how that would pencil for the system overall, because it's just simply not my wheelhouse. But from a microbial perspective, um, I mean, we know flax is pretty chewy <laughs> where I come from. When I was a kid on the farm, I remember burning it a lot. <laughs> um, and so it's it's difficult to break down, but it certainly is highly mycorrhizal. And so um, it can have some really, really strong benefits in rotation from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Whereas when we think about canola, big deal crop in Western Canada, we know it's non-mycorrhizal, yeah. right? So if you were, for example, trying to nurture um, Indigenous mycorrhizal populations in your soil, you might look to a crop like that every once in a while to balance off having the non-mycorrhizal brassicas in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good point. And um, Bobby, thank you. 
for reminding everyone to think of the soil bugs and not and you're still gonna have to do the work on your own because she's not your agronomist so there you go um okay <laughs> which, is, which is perfectly fine okay we're just so to that end though we haven't talked we talked a little bit but i want to bring in i'm going to play one clip here um because then we get a close-up look of, of some of uh, dr dave's trials um producer jay we're going to go to the clip with albert tenuta talking about the disease impact of having a diverse rotation and wheat in rotation. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, that and more after we go to this clip. Hey, you've been getting calls lately after some rain about how to manage stem, root rots, fungal issues. Um, Tell us about what you're hearing and, and why you hear these questions and uh, get these calls after rain. Yeah, I'm not surprised at all. We were very dry for a considerable amount of, you know, May and June through this area. And then just recently over the past, you know, couple of weeks, we've seen anywhere from three to eight or more inches of rain. And after those pounding saturated soil type rain events, it's not unusual to get calls from growers saying, hey, my field doesn't look right. Parts of it are going backwards, other parts are doing well, what's up? And you can see those exact symptoms in this field as well here at Ridgetown. So what are we seeing here, uh, Albert? What's happening after that rain? Yeah, so this, we're fortunate here that we've got long-term rotation plots here. These are run by Dr. Dave Hooker here at the University of Guelph. These have been established for over 30 plus years. And it's uh, looking at different rotations, corn, soybeans, and wheat. And here what we've got are two, you know, two different uh, uh, rotation systems here. The one on the left here is uh, a, a soybean wheat rotation and a soybean corn rotation. And you know, this the background in terms of the soil type, it's about 32% clay, a Brookston clay, but you know, a bit on the lighter side than what we normally would see um, under, you know, say Niagara or into um, Lambton or into Essex County and that. But this is very typical of some of the Brookston clay type soils. Yeah. Now, talk about the different rotations here. You've got different levels of disease, obviously, uh, Albert, depending on you know, what the rotation here. Uh, what are you seeing in the soybean wheat? Yeah, so the soybean wheat is showing a considerable amount of symptoms, you know, and when we talk about root rots, uh, burn, you're talking about, you know, the, the phytophoras, ooh, my seed groups, the phytophora and the pythiums that really like that wet, saturated soil. Then we've got the fusariums and rhizoctonia root rots as well. Those are our big four players. And more than likely, what we're seeing here is that result of that pounding rains, that saturated soil, and here we're looking more, you know, more likely at the phytophora type uh, situation here. And uh, as you can see, these plants are showing their very typical wilting type symptoms. But again, that wheat uh, soybean rotation, which is very typical of our phytophora prone areas of uh, in Ontario, because corn's not quite, um, the, you know, doesn't fit that system there. But you can see here with corn and soybeans in the rotation, you're probably getting a benefit of some of that nitrogen, residual nitrogen in this particular case here. And, uh, and, and that, so that gets that, the plant started, more established root system, able to meet that needs, or at least when you get the rain, utilize it to, to most efficient. Now you got a couple of other rotations that are telling some stories as well. Yeah, and so if we, you know, over here, when you look at the corn, soybean, wheat rotation, we see very little, if any, of the phytophthora in that particular situation. And then if you look at the continuous soybeans, very similar story as what we're seeing with the soybean wheat. So again, one of the you know, management tools that we always promote when it comes to managing diseases and especially those soil borne diseases that are in your field every year or have a risk every year is crop rotation. So a more diverse crop rotation, more adaptability, more ability for those plants to tolerate those stress conditions. Our sponsors for The Agronomist are Profitable Practices, The Soybean School, and The Sharp Edge. The Sharp Edge is a video series where we look to farmers, agronomists, and researchers to give us the sharp edge on everything from agronomic problem solving to increasing profitability and improving sustainability. The Sharp Edge is made possible by support from Mazex. Check it out on our YouTube channel.
All right. Our segue into more resilient systems. It It's a buzzword. We're going to embrace it fully. I think it has meaning and it's important. Let's face it. Every year, there is likely some challenge our crops are going to have to face. Maybe it's too wet at seeding or planting. Maybe we get a mid-season drought. Um, maybe it's a hailstorm. Whatever it may be, there's always going to be adversity throughout the year. So I want to talk about how um, having diverse crop rotations, how that impacts, of course, our soil microbes, and how that impacts soil health. And so diseases, one of the things, Bobby, as you touched on right at the beginning, one of the things we think about are pathogens, for sure, and, and certainly diseases in our soils. Um, but now we will go, Dr. Dave, if we can, to slide seven and talk about how some of these trials perform under pressure and open that, that conversation. And then we do have a question about putting forage in rotation. And so I am going to say thank you ahead of time that we'll get to talk about that. But okay, the floor is yours, Dr. Dave. What do we know about rotation under pressure? Yeah, so these are, we analyzed um, different years of, um, let's say, dry conditions where it's fairly dry around silking and other years were had fairly optimal soil water contents and other years some years were is actually wet around um silking time and so those are the critical kind of stages of corn right around silking time anyway when we looked at the corn soybean rotation and these are the yield responses compared to continuous corn and so in that in that lower um lower left, we have a corn soybean rotation. And this is the rotation effect that we have. And I'm just gonna look at my slide here because I just can't see very well the my screen here. Happens this, to the this is, yep, Yeah, this is, uh, this is the rotation effect in corn soybean rotation compared to continuous corn. And as you can see, the corn soybean rotation even had less yields. We had between I think um, four and 5% less yield in a corn soybean rotation than we did continuous corn. But when we looked at the corn soybean wheat rotation and a SIGGRAPH just right above in the plow side on the left-hand side, um, on the top left, you can see we have the rotational responses there. And our rotational responses, remember in that previous graph that we showed about, you know, 17 bushel per acre increase in corn soybean wheat rotation compared to corn soybean rotation, a 17 bushel per acre corn yield increase. Well, this is the average across cool, hot, dry, and optimal. But in a hot, dry year, that's where we see the greatest yield increases or the greatest response, you know, to a rotation in um, where where we have very hot, dry stress conditions around the critical time of corn development. And this is where we see a lot of rotation effects, not only when it's dry out, but if the crop is under stress, it just, it's, we have data that shows that the more, um, the longer the rotation that we have, or if, the, if let's say in this case, corn follows wheat in the rotation, if we don't have many soybeans in the rotation, those rotations seems to be more resilient, you know, against various stresses, whether disease stress, uh, a nutrient stress, or, um, or say water deficits. So, and, and shout out to boo soybeans um but they don't do good things in rotation guys no, anyway i'm just kidding no. it's my bias showing um but bobby so so in this discussion and there's a few slides that we'll get to on on soil organic matter but uh, from from the soils perspective in a in a like this a hot dry year or you know quite optimal temperatures those sorts of things what what happens in a soil potentially that can support those crops in a tough year in like in this case a, a very diverse crop rotation versus not what is happening at, at sort of the soil level potentially well i guess first and foremost we know that soil organic matter holds water so um, if you've got increased soil organic matter there's increased potential to hang on to soil moisture when it's limiting i mean not hang on to as in withhold from the crop but um, hang on to from previous precipitation events. Um, 
rotation, strong rotations also tend to have good um, sort of nutrient turnover dynamics. And so if you could have, for example, nitrogen mineralization chugging along steadily through a, through a hot, dry period, um, that would be beneficial to the crop because nitrogen moves very much in water in the soil. And so if you've got already like low nitrogen mobility conditions and then you shut down nitrogen mineralization, then, you know, cascading effects. So um, I haven't specifically spent a lot of time studying microbial community responses to hot, dry conditions, but certainly they, there are many plant growth promoting bacteria that live in and on roots bacteria and fungi and they can interact with those roots through signaling pathways in both directions to alleviate plant stress and there's plenty of evidence for that um, in, in most cropping systems so. so and and so this this does bring in that discussion on soil organic matter right um, and I, I mean everyone I think is it's the holy grail of you know if we can build soil organic matter fantastic but i think there's a lot of farmers that would be very very happy simply to maintain and and do no do no harm for where they're at uh to coin a phrase so um both of you have some really neat slides that i do want to touch on here I, i'm going to start with bobby's and then um dr dave i've got yours and you've got some qr codes on there which i'm excited to follow a little later uh but producer jay if you could go to bobby's uh slide one and this is if you can explain this to us, Bobby, what is happening? Because uh, I think a lot of people just instinctively like uh, the question of, you know, what about putting long-term perennial crops in rotation for hay or pasture? Um, most people know when you break a hay field, you get phenomenal yield the next year. Or if you want to add organic matter, you need to have plants growing there. So what is actually happening? Why is it that a high diversity potentially might either maintain soil organic matter or build soil organic matter? Yeah, so this is this particular is a conceptual representation of someone else's work, uh, Lisa Tiemann, and this comes from the long term, some long term plots at the Kellogg Biological Station. But what they found was in a high diversity uh, corn system, they found increased soil organic carbon as well as total nitrogen and increased aggregation. And so in their particular system, um, there were positive benefits re that they, you know, inferred were being realized through changes in microbial activities that were building soil organic carbon, increasing total nitrogen stores. And so, I mean, one thing that we can't lose sight of is that in a diverse rotation, we are applying different levels of nutrients as well as removing different amounts of nutrients. So mm -hmm. um, again, this sort of goes back to that idea of um, balanced diet, right? So if we have corn after corn after corn after corn at really high nitrogen rates, which we know we need to support continuous corn systems. Um, that's a whole different story when it comes to feeding the below ground community uh, than a diversified rotation where you can all but skip the nitrogen in a legume uh, phase, for example, or where you might have a crop like flax or a highly mycorrhizal crop um, that can actually solubilize phosphorus and make it available for subsequent uh, crops. Mm -hmm. So now we've got, uh, Dr. Dave, if you want, um, I, of course, they're your slides, you can choose, but I was going to jump to slide nine, because of course, we are running out okay. of time. Um, in, in that this sort of builds on that discussion of where some of this is coming from. Um, and loving the QR codes. I feel like QR codes are having like this renaissance, but anyway. Um, okay, so this I do think though is part of the discussion and hats off to Bobby and, and researchers like you who have been making this much more part of every conference now of this discussion of we have to think about what's happening at the microbial level, but also that, you know, we used to always think residue, residue, residue. That's what we needed to build soil organic matter, but it's not the residue that's doing the work per se, right? We have to have microbes there to to drive these cycles and it's it's them that are actually contributing as well in a couple ways so um uh -huh. what what do we need to know about dead microbes dr dave yeah so um so it, it's kind of funny because bobby just a few minutes ago she said that she was not an agronomist and she's a soil microbiologist and and i'm just the opposite so it just seems weird <laughs> have you here. it just seems weird talking about soil microbiology with with the microbiologist on on the mm -hmm. on the line here on the panel, but 
Anyway, um, if I say something wrong, you could just jump right in, Bob. You can say that. I like what I see up there. So yeah, there we go. Okay, good, good, good. So just um, we all know that solar organic matter is the center of you know a healthy a healthy kind of soil. And so we all value soil organic matter. And I told my class just the other day that it's just like gold. You should treat it like gold bars in your soil. And who would want to reduce the amount of gold? You know, they have an inventory, like nobody would want to do that. So everybody wants to build up organic matter. And we know now based from uh, just relatively recent research that microbial turnover is extremely important in maintaining or building up organic matter, not only just organic matter, but the quality organic matter uh, in the soil. And so this is like organic matter uh, buildup. Uh, microbes are responsible for 50% of that soil organic matter increase. And they don't only break down residues, they uh, produce compounds that, that build or uh, manufacture soil organic matter as well. So that's why microbes are like very important. And when they die, they're, of course, their bodies become soil organic matter as well. We, we really love our microbes in life and in death. Okay, now there's, there, it is fascinating. And um, I'm glad that we have Bobby here to keep you in check, Dave. Um, okay, good. Right, so this is good. We've got our, our built-in fact checking and vice versa. Uh, okay, so Mark has a question. Are there certain crops or root styles that help release different nutrients to a plant available form? such as P or K or N. So this, I think, gets into that question of root exudates. Um, it gets into that question of, you know, what's in the in the soil microbiome there to release some of that. And Bobby, you sort of mentioned some of those uh, as well, as far as what's in our soil to do it. So again, this, I think, kind of falls in line with that question of, you know, is there a magical crop that goes in there and does these things? Um, so who would like to answer this one first? I think there's a lot of ways we could we could go with this. Yeah, I, I think Bobby should have a turn. She's <laughs> next. There you go. Bobby's turn. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. long story short, yeah, there are different kinds of uh, functional root traits that do mine nutrients differently on their own or in conjunction with the microbes that they cooperate with. And so um, we've talked briefly about mycorrhizal fungi. We've talked about um, nitrogen-fixing bacteria in legumes. Um, so other things to think about are deep rooted crops. So we often think about roots um, growing deeply to forage for water, but when they do that, they can also mine phosphorus from deeper in the soil profile. So sometimes we see an accumulation of phosphorus near the surface because that's where we apply it. But by and large, at least our soils here are high total phosphorus, low available phosphorus. And so if we can use deep rooted crops to bring more of that total P into the available pool, take it up and transport it nearer to the surface, that's one mechanism by which a different deep rooted um, crop species could change dynamics of nutrient cycling in, in this case, uh, across the soil depth profile, for example. Yes, down in front, Dr. Hooker. Yeah, yes. And I just think that this discussion is just um, very good. And the thinking that uh, Mark raised this question, I think like it's a valid question, of course, plant exudates, root exudates are known, like certain root exudates are known to solubilize nutrients, you know, from organic matter and um, from uh, soil minerals in itself. And I just think this, it underlines the fact that maybe it's not diversity that we should be talking about. It's, it's about functional aspects of certain crop species or plant species. They do have a benefit. And what Bobby was just mentioning too about certain crop plants, you know, can um, do this for nutrients, but they can also adjust or, or um, I guess, uh, pose a different uh, a population dynamic in terms of adjusting the populations for pathogen, different pathogens that affect crops as well. I think maybe it's not diversity per se, but it's just the functional aspects and the frequency of crops and the rotation and the specific mm -hmm. plant species. I think that's really important in a crop rotation rather than crop rotation yeah. diversity. Right. In, in that thinking about, you know, it doesn't mean you need 10 different types but you have to be thinking right. about rooting depth and and exactly whether or not they increase certain um you know friends below or 
perhaps are hard on them, like canola, yeah. um, those sorts of things. That's now, true. but this also brings up there are physical things too. So, so Bobby, you've mentioned, of course, um, rooting depth, perhaps being able to access different nutrients. Water, as well, of course, plays a role in that. So, uh, Laurent Van Arkel has has said, what about putting long term perennial crops in the rotation, such as hay as pasture? And I think this is in relation, uh, Dr. Dave, to your work. And there's another question of cover crops that sort of comes along that line. So do we have, I think in Manitoba, I want to say that there are some long-term trials that do go into four years of alfalfa, I want to say, in the rotation to put a perennial in there. But do we have anything in Ontario that is looking at adding something perennial in a cropping mix? So that is like an intercropping uh, polyculture type of situation and we do not have any long-term trials looking at that and Woody you are just on the cutting edge of research doing that I think in Ontario okay and I just think it, it's just fascinating research right <laughs> so I'm gonna uh, yes okay so first of all it says Laurent we all know it's Woody but oh, oh, um Lawrence, sorry. yeah okay Lawrence no it's Woody Van Arkel <laughs> um but I mean yes for for right now to add perennial back into a cropping system would be considered cutting edge. But if we go back mm, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, that's kind of, that would have been, and then if we go back 50 years, that actually would have been very common, right? Because more people had livestock, more people had a reason to grow forage. And so it, it made a lot of sense to have forage in rotation, which yeah. would have inferred a lot of these benefits that we've actually, but, we've lost yeah. some of those benefits because we don't have the livestock to feed necessarily anymore. But what you're talking about is um, is uh, is a crop rotation, you know. Uh, and yeah, we're talking about still here is. what yep. Woody. But but what Woody is doing is uh, when you have one crop of the same species in the field, that is monoculture, right? Right. And right? But when you have multiple between, crops, I mean? yeah. Yeah, if you have multiple crops in the same field grown at the same time, that is polyculture. And I think that's what that's what Laurent is uh, referring to about perennial crops. Like growing perennial crops, is he? Right. I'm not sure. In between. Oh, well, I think, well, yeah. and, and Woody, if you could, uh, yes, because yeah. I've seen those, I've seen the, the discussion as well on putting yeah. strips of potentially perennial crops in between. So a, oh, yes. a, a, yeah. a polycrop. And so, um, yes, is that our, yeah. can we, and this is the research that's interesting, can we, by putting in strips of perennials or strips of other crops, influence the overall microbiology of the field and infer some of those benefits even if we're still doing our typical corn soy wheat or or whatever the case may be mm -hmm. um so yeah so i think dave he's asking you to do some trials um yeah. i'll yeah. put it there <laughs> now the the other question is as well um does a does a diverse cover crop in the rotation bring a benefit now we talked a bit, a bit about this uh, on our cover crop episode of you know if you're going to use a cover crop, does it need to be 10 different species or is just having a cover crop there a, a good enough benefit? So Dave, you're, you're shaking your head and Bobby, you've got some thoughts, I'm sure. So we'll, we'll go with that one. If I'm going to grow a cover crop, do I need 10 different species to, to get a benefit? Yeah, no. Okay. The Why not? The, yep. Yep. The answer is no, because what we should be doing is, managing a cover crop with a species that have a functional some functional purpose to them so choose your species according to the functional purpose not just because it's diverse diversity is good let's go with a diverse type species mix and that's that's not what we should be thinking that's what maybe a more of an ecologist would think but we can't apply that ecology to ag management because we have to make good decisions in agriculture based on, you know, what a species might bring to the picture. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's why diversity in itself is just not a good enough answer. We just have, have to have some functional purpose to it. And that's my rant of the day. Okay. And I'll, <laughs> Bobby, I'll be quiet. No, don't you dare. Bobby, do you, do you have thoughts to tell Dave he's wrong or do you agree? Uh, you know, we're taking baby steps into cover cropping in this game, you know, constant concerns with moisture limitations and a very short shoulder season. Um, I guess live roots and photosynthetic carbon input are a good thing from a microbiological standpoint. And if you can enhance 
those basic benefits by including either particular species or groups of species that have enhanced functional attributes, then that's a good thing if you can get it to establish and it makes economic sense. But again, I think that's more like wading into field agronomy. And, and so, um, you know, Dr. Kate Congreves uh, is doing some work in that area at the University of Saskatchewan. There's some really good work going on at the U of M. So yeah, Yvonne yeah. Lally's doing some great work in others. So I think, um, we're going to learn a lot about how cover crops, how we can make cover crops work and how we might struggle in the next few years on the prairie. So the jury's still okay. out, I think. Yeah. Unfortunately, without water, it sort of doesn't matter if you have 10 species in the cropping um, uh, mix. Yeah. So Ray DeBanco, thank you, Ray, for, for hanging out with us. And uh, Ray's got a great comment. No disrespect to agronomists and Dr. Dave and to Ray included, but soil microbiologists have jobs for life. It is very true. Yep. There is so many things we do not yep. understand That's right. or, yeah, or do not know on. yet. There is a lot yep. happening down there. Um, now, I, yep. yeah, exactly. Bobby, Bobby Choice, really good job. Um, now, I will say, though, uh, Dave, I, the long-term trials are fascinating, and I'm so glad that, that you're doing them and sharing so much of this work um, because it's super important. And you're right. We're asking, I think we're asking better questions because we have better data or or we have more things to consider and that means we ask better questions uh just for the record woody did say he was thinking of doing both going back to putting hay into rotation as well as the in-between so he is actually considering both mm -hmm. to which i say you're that's exactly right but not for where he lives there's no livestock anyway get yourself some mm -hmm ruminants okay now we are <laughs> we're out of time um but to both of you thank you so much there is so much um that we we could go on a whole other hour uh, but as some parting thoughts dave i feel like you have more to say and everyone go and take his course there you go and when bobby's back you can take hers um, but yes parting <laughs> thoughts dr dave what do we need to think about with rotation well, the parting the parting thought is with crop rotations when we have a good crop rotation with certain number of species we have to be thinking of the actual species and actual the frequency of species in the rotation and all of that is um is uh, like produces that big rotation effect that we're all looking for and i know the more that i know about soil microbiology the more the greater respect i have that you know microbiology has a huge role in organic matter um uh cycling uh, nit nutrient cycling um all kinds of different stress tolerances in in plants and to understand the system we have to have a team approach like have a team of researchers specialists to figure out to understand some of these different processes so agriculture can use them can apply them mm -hmm. okay that's bobby? my parting word or two <laughs> bobby you get the last word on this one yeah, so I guess um, huge respect to everyone that I know in agricultural research who manages long term trials and fights the good fight to keep them going because the kinds of things that we can learn about soil biology and long term trials are very different than what we can learn if we're in a short term, what I like to sort of facetiously call noisy systems, right? They haven't adapted to even a near equilibrium state. And so those long term trials are super, super crucial for, for really getting a handle on true shifts in, in below ground ag agronomy, ecology, what have you. Um, we didn't talk about it today, but we've looked at canola systems and we did see increased incidence of disease. So particularly black leg and continuous canola. But interestingly, we also saw increased incidence of the good guys. So pseudomonas, serratia bacteria, penicillium in the diverse rotations. And so we didn't really get into that today, but those diverse canola rotations yielded higher. And sure enough, we're starting to see the, the signals that the good guys are there in greater abundance, as well as you know the positive influences that the, the diverse rotations have on suppressing disease. So lots and lots of fun stuff going on below ground. I sure feel like I picked a good, uh, a good area of specialty in soil science. So. You really did. So, but I also think, you know, not that long ago, even let's say start of my career, you know, 20 years ago, let's say, like thinking about rotation from the perspective, you mentioned canola, um, you know, I sort of always thought about it from the perspective of, you know, you're rotating because you don't want that host there, but we always thought above ground, right? You always thought, 
you know, it's the host plant, but we weren't thinking even remotely about what is potentially at play below ground, um, supporting that plant or attacking that plant or vice versa. Um, far beyond just, you know, exactly that one disease or whatever. And yet, so I do, I think we've really started to, to shift our mindset away from, you know, just above ground and, and really thinking about all the choices we make uh, in field management and what impact they have uh, to the overall system, which is pretty cool. And I will say yes. And thank you, Bobby, for the shout out on maintaining those long-term trials um, to Dr. Dave's point about trying to get that equilibrium points, so we can really start to tease out some real answers is so key. So anytime any of you are touring long-term trials, um, tell wh whoever funds them that you appreciate them and they should keep doing it. Um, that's our plug for the evening. So there you go. Um, all right. <laughs> thank you both so much for joining me tonight. This has been fascinating. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone in the comments uh, for your great questions and for keeping the conversation going. We really appreciate it. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking, we're going to switch to insects next week. I think we're going to talk about some wheat midge. Uh, so join us uh, next week as well. And uh, as always, you can find us on YouTube or head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists to get those CU credits. Thank you, Dr. Dave and Dr. Bobby. We'll see you next Thank week, you. everybody. It's been Cheers. Fun.